Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Bob Ebel. I am uh, moderating the session tonight on a topic of great importance to St. Paul as well as Minnesota. And that is the issue of out, how do we finance fiscal infrastructure? Uh, the program has been organized by St. Paul Strong. Uh, just to introduce myself, I am a former Minnesotan. I work for the Latimer Tax Study Commission and went on to work for Senator Dernberger in Washington and then on to the World Bank. One of my activities that, uh, at the World Bank was to work on infrastructure finance globally and the kind of issues that we are say, we're discussing tonight on St. Paul about where we should have, how we should finance infrastructure, why it's important, are the same issues that the cities all over the United States, all over the world are following. The specific issue we have tonight started in the 2014-2015, uh, uh, after a period of time of the, of the uh, city using special assessments rather than tax finance uh, for the infrastructure projects on uh, road and street repairs uh, came to a head when one of an attorney in, uh, in uh, St. Paul, Jack Heschler, picked up the issue for the, the First Baptist Church, which argued that the special assessment approach had serious problems of equity and efficiency. Uh, and that's the topic we'll be discussing, discussing tonight. And let me just say that the topic is about who pays for infrastructure, uh, but the topic of keeping infrastructure maintenance uh, going and funding and financing well is extremely important. Uh, we've seen that this is certainly in Minneapolis with the collapse of the uh, Interstate Highway uh, 35 West when people died. Uh, we also, uh, of course, have the problems of with the, the uh, old and cold city of St. Paul having to have a sustainable system of how to pay for our infrastructure, not just roads, but uh, all the other varieties. But we're going to have a discussion in three parts here. We're going to begin with a discussion of the St. Paul finances. We'll proceed from there to talk specifically about who pays and the issue of benefits, who benefits from infrastructure, who benefits particularly from street and road repairs and maintenance, and the question then who should pay. And from there, we're going to take a look uh, ahead at where does St. Paul uh, go from here. Uh, Greg Bleese is going to start out. Greg is the uh, uh, expert. He's been with the St. Paul government for 41 years as a finance expert. Uh, he was the head of the Long Range Capital Improvement Committee, which is capital financing, really important stuff, um, and was the Mayor, uh, uh, Mayor Latimer's budget director for nine years. Uh, he's also been a city policy director for, this, for the, uh, the uh, city council, and he's now a consultant ranging on a variety of issues. And then we're going to go to Peter, uh, Peter Nelson and Simon Tiger. Uh, Peter is a, uh, a uh, senior fellow at the Center for American Experience. Uh, he's an expert on both state and local finance and public administration. Uh, the intersection between the two is critically important for our our uh, infrastructure uh, finance question. Uh, he is, uh, in 2016, Peter filed an amicus brief with uh, Jack Heschler on the uh, Baptist Church versus St. Paul and be discussing that tonight. He's a graduate of the University of Minnesota Law School and was on the uh, law review there. Uh, Simon Tegerhoff is, uh, a was a plaintiff uh, in the, uh, in the uh, case that uh, Jack took up. Um, he is a, uh, a, a barrister from London. He's the founder of Fair Street St. Paul. At present, he's also on the St. Paul Planning Commission, and he's chair of the Summit Hill uh, Association Zoning and Land C Committee. To wrap it up, we have our colleague Ellen Brown. Ellen is an ex has had executive roles throughout uh, her career in St. Paul, worked, has worked with the Citizen League, was particularly important in the study of the payment in lieu of tax, the pilot a study that the, uh, the Citizens League has reduced in, in uh, 2007, was it? 17. 2017. Uh, uh, Ellen worked for MnDOT, has, so has, she has a highway experience structure uh, um, uh, background, and uh, so she will be picking up on where we go from here. 
so with that, uh, let me turn to Greg uh, and um, give us a sense of how did we ever get here? Thank you. Um, in the right of way maintenance fund, when we talk about street maintenance, right. that is basically talking about cleaning the street, chip sealing the street, and every once in a while they do what's called a mill and overlay. And there's always a constant battle between who benefits the most, they should pay the most, versus is this funding source regressive and does the poor people, are they not able to pay? So the question is, if you have a building or a church along the street, uh, who's benefiting from the, uh, from the uh, improvement of that street? Right. And that's where the city council has to make some choices about, well, how to define the benefit to the benefit area. Absolutely. And one of the options the council always has is property taxes. Now, what's good about property tax? If you have a tax levy, um, to some degree, it doesn't relate to the ability to pay. So, for example, if I have a house and I lose my job, I still have to pay my property taxes and I have no income, okay? On the other hand, the state of Minnesota, at the end of the year, looks at how much property taxes you made and what your income is, and you have income-adjusted homestead property tax relief. And, and, and that's a good thing. The state of Minnesota gives aids to cities called local government aid. It's to help finance their budget. But when they do that, they also at times put levy limits on. And they say, okay, we're going to give you a lot of local government aid, but you can't raise property taxes. Or you can only raise property taxes 3%. Unless, of course, there's a referendum for your school district and the citizens vote uh, a, an increase. But there's times when the state has said to the city of St. Paul, we're going to give you $70 million worth of local government aid for your budget next year. Don't raise property taxes. And six months later, the state's economy goes into the tube and they only give us $56 million. We end up with an adopted budget. We can't we no longer raise property taxes and we'll be short $14 million. That has happened. So from an elected mayor and council's perspective, uh, assistance from the state of Minnesota is a good thing. Um, but when they cut back, then when the next budget book comes around, they look at alternative ways to finance because the local government aid isn't there and there's a levy limit in place. So what do they do? They look to increase special revenue funds, special funds. And this is where we get into our... And this is where we had a major problem with the right-of-way maintenance. Now, let me ask Peter here. Um, um, now we're into the issue about, well, as Greg's laid out the, the choices, this tension here between the, the, the special fund and uh, and how to finance that. And is it a user charge? Is it tax finance? How do we get to this point where uh, we're in a legal dispute between the city and the, uh, and the taxpayers? Sure, absolutely. When you look back at, back at history, um, that we had this right-of-way assessment uh, put in place in the early 1900s. Um, and it's, it's been there to fund some services, but, not, but in, initially it wasn't there to fund a lot of services. You know, I think it was fun, there to fund like sprinkling of the roads to keep dust down when the horses were going over it. Um, and, and that's sort of where it all started. And you had, this, uh, you had this assessment on the books that was used for those purposes and their limited purposes. And um, I think what, you know, what Greg was talking about was sort of some of these pressures that happen when you have some restrictions on how much you can raise property tax revenues. And the LGA program puts some limitations on that. And there's also limitations on how far you can raise a property tax simply by, because cities compete with other cities. And so the city of St. Paul can't raise their property taxes much higher than neighboring communities. Otherwise, they're not gonna let, people aren't gonna move into the city of St. Paul. Property taxes matter a great deal <clears throat> and they're hard for cities 
to increase because of that competitive dynamic. And, and so over the years, cities often find it harder and harder to fund their, their services, and they also find it very hard to raise taxes to fund those services. And, and so the city of St. Paul started relying on some other resources. And one of those resources was the right-of-way assessment. And they started expanding the, uh, what that right-of-way assessment can pay for. And in the process, they started increasing the assessment to be able to pay for services that were otherwise being paid for through the property tax system. And as I understand it, this, this started to expand more and more and more st starting around 1993. And, and so year after year, I think we were probably adding, and Greg knows a little bit more of the details, I think. I, I, I can give you an example just um, between the years 2003 and 2008, um, the general fund had been financing snow plowing for winter time. They moved that um, cost, which was $4.3 million, to the street maintenance fund in 2003. The traffic program was moved. Well, let, let me step back. They used to call it the street maintenance fund. They changed the name to right-of-way maintenance okay. so that they could put something in the right of way besides streets, besides street maintenance. So they did the traffic program, then they put in 2000, again in 2003, they put the boulevard tree trimming program in the assessment fund, and they put the sidewalk improvements um, in the assessment fund. They financed the city lobbyist in the assessment the fund. Lobbyist? A lobbyist, yep. And, um, but they didn't, but, but they said they didn't raise taxes, right? Right. And in 2004, <laughs> they, um, put, uh, house, two housing inspectors in, uh, 2005, they financed the lighting program with assessments. That was a big one, 3.2 million. Then they financed the sidewalk bonding program. So this um, is what we're, and noxious weeds. Okay, now that was done at a time when local government aid was cut, when the state was having a problem. And the city said, okay, we got levy limits, we can't necessarily raise property taxes, although they could have some, um, but, they, but they didn't wanna. And I should point out, when we talk about St. Paul property taxes, the mayor and the council are only responsible for 30% of your tax bill. So the biggest is the school district at 34%. And then you have the county at, um, I forgot, 29%. Uh, so now we're, now we're having the issue about who pays. So Greg just walked through all of the right. services that started being added to this right of way assessment, which increased the assessment, the amount of the assessment on properties and leaders at the time, Mayor Randy Kelly was very clear that we're using this to hold down property taxes. That was the purpose okay. of moving all of this. And what happened was that you were able to then impose this assessment on certain properties that were otherwise tax exempt. And that includes churches and, and certain schools and hospitals that are nonprofits and other public charities. So that was one of the things that that did. It allowed, it expanded the properties that were subject to to the to this and so the whoever was not subject to the property tax and and it was charged based on the lineal square footage so your street front frontage so the so if the I'm amount a church of, or a 25 story building I'm going to have a linear charge yes. based just on in front in, in front of my front door absolutely and so what you found is that there were some very unique circumstances in the city where some churches and some other properties were paying substantially more than I think most of us would, ag would agree is fair. And so you had the First Baptist Church that had this corner lot. And the corner lots were very problematic, of course, because they had two streets, two sides of the street to pay for. And, uh, and so they were paying, uh, they ended up at one point paying over $15,000 a year in this assessment. And 
the UBS Plaza, which is 25 stories, that's what you're referencing, the UBS Plaza was paying just over $5,000. So the churches were paying triple. And when we talk about benefit, who's benefiting from the roads? The UBS Plaza has hundreds of cars coming in to, to that building every day over the roads. And the church during the week has very few cars. Um, it was operating a daycare uh, for homeless people at the time. And so they weren't driving to the church during the week. And so it was, it was a very unfair situation. And, and what that led to was a very sympathetic plaintiff to file a lawsuit and to start settling out, well, what's, was this an appropriate way to fund road maintenance? You know, in economics, sort of the, the mantra, and I think it's the right mantra, is that you, you want to levy a tax or fee on those who benefit. Um, and, um, and now the question is, how do you identify the beneficiaries? So we have two issues going here. One is, um, uh, who's using those roads? And you mentioned the, the uh, UBS Plaza people more likely to use it than the church. But you know what? I mean, you come down, you drive downtown, right? You're benefiting from it. Here's the issue. I'm, I also use those roads. I've been using the roads for three days, right? So suddenly we have a benefit area that's no longer just this linear thing, this linear measure. What about the homeowner? Well, I was going to say, Bob, that um, you know, that example exposes the fallacy at the heart of this, right? The, the, the idea that somebody owns a street in front of their house, their church, their business, whereas it's evident to everybody that the value of the streets is in the network, it's in the connectivity. So, you know, I might live in a home, but then I want my dog, I walk to school um, with my kid, I jog in the streets, right? The whole point is that I'm connected. A single stretch of road is, is completely valueless. Um, so, you know, try, by, by trying to institute this kind of system, the city attempted to kind of explicitly link um, the value of the street maintenance to the number of feet of frontage you had. Yeah. Um, and, and that's probably where the problem started. And so, but, but a really, excuse me, a really important thing here, you've all alluded to it, is it was really all began because mayors in particular were trying to avoid proposing a raise in property taxes. Yes, sometimes the state put a limit on it because of local government aid. But in my opinion, it was really largely a political issue of mayors not and city council not wanting to raise property taxes because it was politically unpopular. And so they just kept shoving as much money, as much of the uh, cost of government as they could into fees and assessments. And you know, we're seeing that happen uh, nationally. If you had gone to an economics class 10 years ago, you'd hear about the, the, the tripod of the, pro of the property taxes, income taxes and sales taxes. And oh yes, we have these things called user charges. And uh, now in the last decade, there's been a rush, and Greg pointed out by across the country, in St. Paul too, to move towards the, an, there's an anti-tax uh, climate to those charges. And we are now seeing actually that, that, that uh, uh, user charges now have eclipsed income taxes and are equal to property taxes in terms of local budgets mm -hmm. in the United States. So this tension that we're seeing played out and it led to a lawsuit. Yeah. And there's some real legal problems with going down this path. Okay. Because I think as Simon was alluding to, the tax system, taxes go to fund public purposes. And I think there's some principles here I should probably start talking about Please. regarding how cities can raise revenue under our constitution and under our statutes. And so under the constitution, basically cities can raise revenue through the tax system. They have the power that they have the taxing power. They can also raise revenue through regulatory fees, and that's done through the police power. And the police power is basically the power that governments ha governments have to promote sort of the general welfare, to promote safety, uh, and to promote the health of the population. And and that's a power that's inherent in it in every city, every government. You get to do that. And the taxing power is also inherent. You have to be able to tax people to provide government services. And, and so you've got this sort of distinction between the police power and the taxing power in terms of the, where the power lies to be able to raise revenue. And for public purposes, 
so you have to raise it through the tax side. You have to raise it through the through tax revenues, for instance, like the property tax revenues. And for regulatory fees, you have that's where you get the police power. But those regulatory fees are, are only supposed to go towards funding the cost of the regulation. So that's what we would call cost recovery. Just yes. cost recovery. Exactly. And so where where this unfairness came in is that the churches looked at this structure and they saw that these fees were going to fund really a public purpose. You can't exclude people from the roads. And, every, and, it's, and the connectivity that Simon talked about is something you can't exclude people from. And yet the churches were paying for that through this fee. And that seemed fundamentally unfair and illegal to the churches. And so they filed a lawsuit. And in that lawsuit, they, they went to the district court and the district court actually ruled against them. Um, they said, no, no, this, this fee is, is proper because the fee goes to fund things that the city can do through the police power. So it, it went to fund things that promoted the, the welfare of the citizens, that promoted safety, safer streets, and so therefore they could do it. They didn't necessarily look, at the, just, the court didn't look at this whole issue of how do you measure that fee though? Am I, is that right or not? They, now, I, I didn't go back to the district court level, but the appellate court, when you, when you look at the appellate court decision, they really didn't get into this distinction uh, as, of a fee versus a tax. And that was one of the biggest problems yeah. with, that, with that decision. And because the appellate court basically upheld the district court and said, well, the city's using these fees to promote to to in, to implement their police power, and and so they they approved it, and so this gets kind of confusing a little bit. And part of the reason why you have some confusion here is because when you look at um, the tax the tax structure under the Constitution, the under the Constitution Minnesota Constitution, the state the local governments can charge an assessment for local improvements, mm -hmm. and that's done through the tax power. And, and so, but, that, but churches aren't exempt from that like they are from other taxes. So the Constitution, as I understand it, said, actually exempts charitable operations. From, it does, it exempts from charitable operations from taxes. From taxes. Right. But so, they still have to pay special assessments. But they could still pay a fee or a, a assessment. But they only have to pay up to the, up to the benefit they receive from it. Okay. They and can't that, pay more then they benefit from it. And now we're back to looking at how do you measure the and benefit. Not, exactly, exactly. So the cities are able, one of their revenue sources is the sales tax, but the state of Minnesota, you still have to go to them and get permission. Do you get a half percent, a one and a half percent tack on? So that's um, one thing. The other thing I wanted to say is regarding the street maintenance assessment, the public works engineers and cost accountants were looking at the cost of service. So if you take the downtown area, they were having their streets swept three times a week, whereas residential houses had their streets swept once in the fall and once in the uh, spring. So when they looked at the cost of service for downtown, they said, oh boy, this is a lot higher. So they had a lot higher assessment fee. There was no attempt to truly measure benefit. What they were trying to do is recover costs. So, so you jumped in, you were a plaintiff. Right. And so, you um, sued on this issue. Yeah, so this was a, a, a secondary lawsuit. So mm -hmm. um, the, the lawsuit that uh, Peter alluded to is the original First Baptist case, which was in 2016. Um, and that essentially ruled that the previous right-of-way system was illegitimate. In response to that, um, the city did take you know, some, some services and took them out of that and put them back in the general fund, but then essentially retreaded or rebranded re, um, re the system um, and relaunched it as a street maintenance service program. And under this system, um, what they said was that um, they were going to charge for street maintenance, so charge for seal coating, okay. uh, mill and overlay, um, lighting, and sweeping. Those were the four services they kept in this, this assessment-based um, 
uh, system. Okay. And they did, did that because they said, well, for these, we have specific authorization in statute. So um, under Minnesota statute and then under um, uh, a, a special law from 1967, we have the ability to, to charge for these things specifically. Legis the, you know, we have laws that say we can do this. Uh -huh. um, unfortunately, um, it, it relied on the, the exact same system as before. It was the exact same problems that we've we've discussed to date, right? So, so um, they had the right to do it, but they didn't necessarily have the right to, to assign the costs the way they assign them. Yeah, and that's a very important distinction. Exactly. In, in right. that, um, so the city is empowered to do all this work, but um, what we discovered in the most recent um, judgment in May was that the judge said, look, all of these statutes give you the opportunity to do this work, but they all include the key phrase, property benefited, which means there has to be a special benefit to that property over and above the benefit to everybody else. Right. And, that, and that's kind of the key problem that we keep running into when we talk about something like street maintenance versus something like trash collection. If I'm the city and I take away your garbage can, um, I'm giving you a direct benefit. Or if I regulate some behavior, so for example, if there's a if there's a, an industrial truck that you know damages the street and puts dust on the street and that kind of stuff, I can I can recover against those things either as a regulatory fee or because I've um, created you know a benefit to you. Um, if I, for example, pave the road to your house for the first time or lay a water line that wasn't there before. I've actually increased the value of your house. And so I've given you a special benefit, and that's why I can tax you differently from anybody else. I can, I can tax you in a non-uniform way. But when you um, try and take that thinking that was really intended for you know, new streets being connected to the network or some other windfall that some set of homeowners got and apply that generally, you, you hit the same problem. Because ultimately, as a homeowner, um, I don't get it. If, if the city plows my street, the benefit I get versus any other motorist or any other pedestrian is, is the same. Right. If the city lights the street, it, I get the same benefit. And so you have a difficulty kind of teasing out and separating those two things because really they're the same. Right. So, so now the lawyers jump in. Yeah, so now the lawyers jump in. And I think and there's, there's this public benefit uh, portion of it, but there's also a uniformity angle. And so when the churches brought their lawsuit, they basically argued that the way that they the city charged the assessment wasn't uniform. And the, co the Constitution has a f just a couple provisions <laughs> that limit how mm -hmm. the city can use their taxing power. And one of them is, is that we've already discussed it has to be for a public purpose. And so your, your revenues that you spend have to be for a public purpose, and, and the revenues that you raise have to be uniform. And, and that's where we run into this, this huge problem. It's not really uniform when a church pays $15,000 and UBS Plaza pays $5,000. To be clear, Peter, um, uniformity doesn't mean you have to tax everybody the same amount of money. It just means you have to have a uniform basis. And Th That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Uniformity is, you have to think of it broadly. Um, there isn't one test for right. uniformity. And you can, you can tax different classes of property differently. And, but in this case, the classes of property and the distinction between how much the churches were paying and the UBS Plaza was paying was not uniform. You could not make a uniform argument. And that's what, that's what the churches argued, that it wasn't uniform. And the city, however, argued, look, the uniformity principle doesn't apply to us in this case because this isn't a tax. This is a fee. And that's, that's where this whole case really hinged on, is this a tax or is this a fee? The city argued it was a fee and based on being a fee, it wasn't subject to this uniformity requirement. It was really just subject to a reasonableness requirement. And the city could basically assess a property based on some reasonable uh, assessment of what they were benefiting. And, and that reasonable, and it's really hard for a citizen to challenge reasonable. what's reasonable. <laughs> so you challenged it. Yes, so um, again, we, we um, from our perspective, we, one morning received um, a huge invoice in the post. So we, we, had, uh, we had bought our property recently, it was our first home, um, and it was a bill for approximately $5,000. Um, it, it said invoice on the top and it threatened that if you didn't pay, then it would be a, um, added to your property taxes with, with interest. Um, as relatively new homeowners, we started knocking on doors in our neighborhood. And we started with a sense of, wait, this, this, this doesn't seem, this seems odd, is this normal? This is something that happens in St. Paul routinely. Um, and then we find out that as we knock on doors in our neighborhood, um, the people are answering the doors and saying, well, this, this is, we've never had this before either. This is in um, 20, uh, 2018, 2019. 
Um, so for example, we talk to retirees who say, we, we can't deal with an unbudgeted expense like this. We, we weren't anticipating this. Mm -hmm. um, and as we dug into it and learned more, we realized that it wasn't just uh, Victoria Street where we live, it was other streets throughout the city. And those streets tended to be the arterials, the rights of ways, um, ultimately places where you get multifamilies, places where you get renters. So it was Stryker Avenue, it was, um, it was Franklin, it was Western Avenue, it was Forest Street, it was, um, it was Arlington, Third Street, Wilson, those, those were the um, 2018 streets. But ultimately, as we knocked on doors, we started hearing stories. We started hearing that, you know, for example, there was, I remember distinctly, there was um, a, a single mother who was on food stamps who had literally borrowed money from friends and family to pay this thing. So you did pay this? Oh, well, we, we, we let it become an assessment. We didn't, we didn't pay it directly. Um, as I say, we, we had an issue with it. We appealed. Right. But, um, so the, the proper way to deal with that was to um, wait for it to become an assessment on our property taxes and then challenge the assessment. There was no mechanism, as we were aware, to challenge um, an invoice that the city had sent to us. And the city, and you were successful with that? Yes. Okay. So, but um, now that, that lawsuit was filed in 2019. Um, and yeah. we had a resolution this year, so it took three years. And w one of the key kind of um, issues here, obviously, is if you look at it from the, you know, we, we thankfully were qualified. So, um, so my wife is an attorney, Christina, um, the, the named Anderson on the, um, in this judgment. Um, and so between she and I, and I, have, I trained as a barrister, so we are the kind of people who can, who can appeal something like this. And similarly, you know, when, when you read the Star Tribune, you read these, um, the, the, the articles, they talk about the churches. They talk about folks like us who can, who can have the resources and the, and the qualifications to pursue an appeal. What they don't talk about are the hundreds of people who make it onto the assessment rolls, who are renters, who, are, you know, who, 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 aren't, um, who don't have the tools necessary to, to challenge these things um, and, and, and end up just paying. Um, and when you think about how, the, how that works, um, in most legal scenarios, there is a statute of limitation. So you can appeal within a year or five years or some period. Mm -hmm. But when it's an assessment, when it uses this, this, this mechanism, the, way, the, the hoops you have to jump through are incredibly onerous. You have to know when the city council is hearing your particular right. assessments. You have to file a written objection. And then you have to, within two weeks, which is unheard of elsewhere, anywhere in the law, you have to file a lawsuit. You have to pay a lawyer. You have to collect your neighbors together. There are um, so many hurdles to doing this. And so from our position, we felt, given our background, given our education, we, we should try and lead the charge here. So I, I, I remember distinctly pushing a stroller through the snow in February um, mm -hmm. with my then under two-year-old in it with my wife as we walked knocking door to door, dropping leaflets, telling people that we should do something about this. Property tax is based on evaluation. The 25-story yeah. building has a higher value than the church or your house. Yeah. To compare apples to apples, yeah. you know, so we looked on our street and a lot of multifamily buildings um, ended up with bills in the region of $3,000, yeah. $5,000, $7,000. The single-family homeowner on the nice side street got a bill for $188. So, you know, you look at the disparity, that's yeah. about a 20 times disparity. And who's paying that bill, right? Okay. It's, it's the, the single-family homeowners are paying a couple hundred dollars here and there for the seal coating. Whereas the, the folks along materials are paying thousands and thousands. So where did you take that? Uh, you did an amicus brief. Yeah, yes, right? I did. Yeah. With uh, Jack's. Jack's uh, uh, and in that brief, I, I carefully outlined the, the distinction between a tax and a fee. And, and again, the churches were arguing this was a tax, but the city was arguing this was a fee. And an, under a tax, you have, you have limitations on a tax. It has to be uniform, it has to be used for public purposes. And and a fee is supposed to just be used to recover the a regulatory fee, supposed to just be used to cover the cost of regulations. They were using that fee to cover the public good of the street. And, and I think one thing that's important to note, because we keep bringing up the UBS Plaza, and, and, and also the fact that you are on a street, on Arterial Street, whereas the side streets behind you were paying 20 times less. Right. And, and so you have, so you have, and the churches were involved in this, and so you've got a few people that are paying more, whereas a lot of other people are not paying more. Mm -hmm. and, and so you've got a lot of people that are actually pretty happy with this situation. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's important to point that out because that's one of the reasons why taxes need to be uniform. 
Taxes need to be uniform so the entire population is levied a tax on a fair basis and so they, everyone sort of is, is in the same position. Uh -huh. So you don't have winners and losers in the tax system because one of the other limits on the tax system is that the people who raise your taxes, the elected officials, have to go back to the voter. Uh -huh. And the city of St. Paul was using a method that let them basically be free from having to go back to the voter because it was an administrative fee that was set not by the elected officials, it's set by the administration. And um, Greg was talking earlier about funds and balancing the budget. If you take this, these charges outside of that, they're not part of the budgeting discussion. They don't get included in the budgeting remarks necessarily. They, they, they're an issue you can kind of sweep under the carpet. And of course, you know, unfortunately, you, you talked earlier about you know, want, really wanting to avoid regressive taxes, wanting to ha um, have progressive taxes. What you ended up here with was a highly regressive tax, a tax that you know, penalized those least able to pay instead of those who are most able to pay. The city of St. Paul has a lot of tax exempt property. And one of the benefits of having a right of way maintenance fee is that you're able to collect some revenue from properties that have some benefit, but don't pay property taxes. So for example, you take the College of St. Thomas, 90% of the students from that in that college come from outside of St. Paul. You go to the neighborhoods around St. Thomas College and everybody is upset that <laughs> the college students take up all the parking spots on the street mm -hmm. and continually wear down their streets. So the idea of being able to levy an assessment against St. Thomas, which does not pay property taxes, um, but levy an assessment for street maintenance, they pass that cost on in tuition to the students, 90% who live outside of St. Paul. So there is some benefit in having reliance on fees as opposed to just property taxes. The question becomes how fair is that fee? How reasonable is it? How much benefit there is? So you could make the case for the church downtown St. Paul that has X amount of footage and is paying $15,000 and another church in the other part of the city has the same footage and is only paying $1,000 because the cost of service is different, but is the benefit different? Greg does bring up a fair point about the fairness of this. You can understand where the, the city's position. Um, the city, when you have a, a nonprofit that really kind of operates like a business, such as a hospital or a college, it does. there's an element of fairness where you think, well, wait a second, they should be paying something for these roads, okay. don't you think? And we'll get to that. And we'll, and we'll get. Did, but what did, all these court cases. Yeah, so. Told me, bring me in here, so, what happened here? So as we've discussed, the, the fundamental issue here was, is this a tax or is it a fee? And what the Supreme Court ruled was that it was a tax, that, okay. that this, this right of way assessment was a tax and therefore it was subject to the constitutional limits on taxation. It had to be uniform and it, had to be used for a public purpose, and it was being used for a public purpose, which is one of the reasons why they ruled the way that they did. And one of the distinctions that they made, because you had the, the confusing element in this case was this notion of the police power. Uh -huh. and, and the police power allows you to regulate, and it allows you to raise revenues to cover the cost of regulation. And that's, that's where you get the power to raise the revenue that way. And where they hit, ran into the problem was when the appellate court said, well, if you're using the fee for, for the, to administer your police powers, then that is okay. Then you can raise revenues through these regulatory fees if you're using it. And what the Supreme Court said was, no, no, the distinction isn't whether you're u using it to, to apply the police power, it's whether you're collecting it under the guise of the police power. And, and in this circumstance, they were, they were claiming they were collecting it, they were using it for the police power, but in, rea in reality, they were collecting it 
as a tax. Mm -hmm. And they were collecting it as a tax because the Supreme Court looked at you know, how, the, how the revenue was being used, and they saw the revenue was being used for public purposes. And when they, when they looked underneath the hood of how everything was operating, they saw that, no, this is really just a tax, and it's not, and it shouldn't be characterized as a fee. And therefore, again, these constitutional limits regarding uniformity. This is, this is the old tax saying, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck, yes, right? that's exactly so, right. Um, so did this question then of, uh, of the, the valuation become a factor rather than just the... the well, what happened, the end result of the Minnesota Supreme Court case is, is the fact that they ruled it was a tax, but they didn't actually ultimately rule on what the churches were supposed to be paying. Because once you ruled it's a tax, then you have to move on to a second question. And that is because it becomes then a, a special assessment and under the tax power. And it's, as a special assessment under the tax power, the city can still charge a special assessment so long as the property is receiving a special benefit and they can't charge, it, charge, a benef charge more than that benefit is received. And so the Supreme Court kicked it back to the district court to decide whether the churches were getting a special benefit um, and, and they could have then been charged that if the special benefit was truly um, increasing their property value. And that's kind of how they measure whether a property is getting a special benefit. Mm -hmm. How much does it increase your property value? Well, in this circumstance, there's really no increase to the property value because it's just maintenance of the roads. And it's obviously, it's, it's understandable, and as Greg's mentioned, why the city would want to look at the adverse Supreme Court judgment in 2016 and attempt to you know retain as much of the program as they could there was some there were some clear benefits it avoided a it allowed the political football to be kicked down the road um, you know even further it maintained marginal revenue from tax exempt institutions there were some reasons to like it um, however it created this sort of very deep unfairness you know so um, when obviously we um, organized our fellow homeowners we, we we got a lot of people down to city hall we talked about it and um, um, even at the time we discovered there were things like um, the city had included the ADA corners, um, just slipped them in there into the uh, charges, whoops, um, and uh, ended up um, ended up refunding those for that year and changing the way they funded it. But um, we ended up in front of the court and um, the court really just referenced the same principles that by then were reestablished law, right? We had an, when else do you get a decision that is only two years old, applies to your system in your city, and you're relitigating it again at district court level. It was, in, in many, it was completely shocking to us, um, which is why we felt um, relatively confident to take this on in the first place. But um, <clears throat> the court applied similar tests, right? So they said, once again, following the 2016 decision, we have to look to two things. We have to look to the language, and we have to look to the purpose. And when they analyzed the language, they said, well, the statutes really kind of tend towards the plaintiffs in this. They talk about the special benefit, they talk about the properties benefited. So on a linguistic analysis, we think the statutes kind of tend in the plaintiff's fellow, but, but actually when you look at the purpose, the purpose is to raise revenue. Um, and I'll, I'll quote, it says, um, it is apparent that the city redrafted its program's parameters in a way to circumvent the ruling in First Baptist in 2016. The city's primary purpose in creating this latest program was to raise the same funding it had raised previously, but to use different language and a different process to raise that funding so as not to run afoul of First Baptist. Um, and then it goes on to say, whatever a city's charter may say, the, municip the municipality may not violate the state constitution. So that was basically open and shut. That was a final determination of the legal issue. So now, we think we have solved the reasonableness and the uniformity issue. Uh, but I think even the maybe a larger issue that we can now begin to introduce, Ellen, is to where we go from here. And one of the places we might start up is the issue that Greg brought up about you've got some of these nonprofits you can capture with a user charge or right. assessment, uh, but not with a property tax. Right, that's certainly part of the problem and one reason that the city was happy to have higher fees. And I should make a, a comment here. Well, first of all, I was on the Citizens League Task Force, which the city and I think Jack and maybe St. Paul Strong asked to get involved and do a study on what are the options here 
What about a payment in lieu of taxes program, commonly called a pilot program? And so I was on that committee just as a community member and a longtime Citizens League member. And we were created in 2017, which was following the first, the first Baptist uh, lawsuits when, the, when, the original, when it was originally apparent that there was gonna be a big problem for the city with tax revenue from this uh, change in, in structure. An important thing that we learned very quickly, right away in the Citizens League work, which surprised, I think, all of us, and there were about 30, 25 or 30 members from a, a, long, a lot of different organizations on the task force, is that St. Paul is not unique in Minnesota. I certainly thought that we had more tax exempt property than other cities, partly because we have state government, right? And we have that big capital complex and we have a bunch of colleges and healthcare complexes and so forth. But in fact, St. Paul and Minneapolis have almost identical uh, tax, tax exempt uh, numbers, whether you count them by value or by uh, capacity or however, the St. Paul, the percentage of tax exempt properties in St. Paul and Minneapolis are both between 25 and 30%, closer to 25. Just uh, two communities in the Twin Cities have significantly higher, Falcon Heights, which has the fairgrounds, and Arden Hills, which has the uh, armories and ammunition plant, are both over 50% tax exempt. So how do we get at this? Does, are, have other studies looked at this? How are you going to right. value so, it? So one of the communities that's done a very, uh, has been very active with this pilot program, this uh, payments in lieu of taxes, is Boston. And we looked at that situation because it's the best known and the most successful. And Boston has a little over 50% of its property is tax exempt. Again, many, many colleges and universities as well as state capital, et cetera. So there was a, they have established a program where in conjunction with the communities, with the nonprofits, they ask for a voluntary contribution. The contributions have to be voluntary, otherwise it's a tax. So they can't say you must pay this, but they work with the uh, nonprofits to decide what is a reasonable amount. Even in Boston's case, where they have like 95% uh, participation cooperation from the nonprofits and paying the voluntary amounts, it still raises less than 1% of their revenue. So it's really important to realize that even with a pilot program, we're not gonna be making a big dent in the St. Paul budget. We're not gonna be making a big contribution to all of this uh, deficit that we're facing. Mm -hmm. So there is, the, the, you know, there's a long way to go with that situation, with that opportunity. There's also uh, the five of the St. Paul private colleges came to the city and the league and said, we're happy to pay, to make contributions because we agree, we use the roads, we et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they are willing to be part of a formal pilot program, but they don't want it to be contractual or so structured that they're required to make those payments. And again, it would be illegal anyway, because then it would be viewed as a tax. Um, one of the challenges that St. Paul has with even doing a pilot program, even if we wanna capture that revenue, is that, and we learn this over and over on the task force, the relationships between the cities and the nonprofits are not that great, uh, or the tax exempt organizations, if you want to. The, the, they're, they're, they're difficult and sometimes antagonistic. And so one of the recommendations that the Citizens League made was the importance of bringing together the nonprofit organizations and the city in a formal sit down and try to work this kind of thing out way, rather than the city going off and saying, oh, let's come up with a pilot program. Let's uh, charge, you know, based on X, Y, or Z. Have the relationships be common. Um, right now, some of these organizations make payments. Some of them don't. 
there's not any rhyme or reason that we discovered to how much people paid, organizations paid, why they paid. It was very hit or miss. And as the League tactfully put it, and I wrote this down, the desired level of collaboration and partnership may be missing in St. Paul and needs attention. And I say some fences need to be mended as well as roads. There's really a lot of work to do to make that happen. But it is possible. We recommended the Citizens League Task Force in 2017 that the city immediately start working with the tax exempt organizations to figure out a pilot program that made sense for St. Paul. To my knowledge, nothing's happened. Maybe it has, but so, again, it's not going to solve the problem that the city has in terms of not having enough money to do what it needs to do. So we just have a few minutes here for a couple of last words, um, and hop in if you wish. But um, I think, first of all, I think it would be useful for uh, this group or other group to convene on this last subject about where we go for him. Bring in the issue, by the way, uh, that uh, Greg brought about non, uh, local non-property taxation. Uh, you mentioned that you can't have an income tax, but that's, the state can allow that. So there are some options here. Um, I also like the point that was raised that there is a role for a user charge special assessment on nonprofits. This one is not a good case at all because I think it violated the reasonable statute, as, as you pointed out, the uniformity. They definitely do have a role, and there is an opportunity there. And I think at least the larger nonprofits who own property agree that they do make use of public services and they should be contributing something to them. Any but last, uh, sorry, just uh, uh, one oh, other please. thing on that point is some of them, uh, well, first of all, nonprofits that rent their space from a for profit landlord they pay. Pay. They pay. So there is that. Yeah. issue as That's well. That's true with government institutions. If they rent, they pay. Right, exactly. When yeah. A lot of state government buildings downtown are in uh, buildings that are not owned by the state. Um, but another thing that came up was whether or not the nonprofits, if they made these contributions, could they direct that their contribution was going to go to X project? Not, right. not necessarily right of way, but maybe they wanted it to go to rec centers to help there are some cities who require that the nonprofits show that it is that it's just going to the local uh, facility, but then you would have to have the state of Minnesota. So this, it's a system, and so the state of Minnesota has to jump in. So we have just a couple minutes for last word. Last word. One thing I think that's important important to understand is when you talk about user fees, you can draw a distinction between whether you have a choice to use it or not. So for example, when you pay your water bill, you, you, you're paying a fee, but the mo you choose how much water you're gonna purchase. Whereas with the street maintenance, you had no choice. So that sort of goes to your argument that in fact it was a tax. Right, second point is I recall uh, communicating with the IRS and if you had a special assessment for street construction it improved your property you could not deduct that from taxes but if you had a special assessment for the right-of-way maintenance fund um, for street maintenance you could count that just like an income tax if you deduction were, but if only you were if, itemizing if you were a business if you were busy. No, uh, no. Okay. Well, you had a last word. Just as a final word, um, we've been through the hoops on this. We have, the legal question has finally been settled. Right. And it's our hope that, you know, no one wants to sue the city, but it's our hope that by doing so, we force a political reckoning. We think it's time for our leadership to step up and to pursue other sources of funding, to look at state f funding, to look at federal funding, to look at county funding, to look at pilot programs and user taxes, and to really figure out how we're going to make our streets better for everybody. I'm going to jump in. And I would just say that with that resolution, I think that resolution is going to bring accountability to city government. And it, it may be that we, the problem here is the fact that the city is not 
governing efficiently and, and not governing as well as they could. Go governing is hard and you have to make hard choices and they've used this fee to not have to make as hard of a choice in certain circumstances. But I would, and I would hope that we would go, we, we might be going back to a point where the city is governing in a way where they're raising their revenues through the normal tax system, which then creates that accountability to the citizen. Public hearings and the like. Exactly. You get the last word. Alan. I would agree with Peter on the on the accountability and moving back to property taxes, mm -hmm. but the 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 loss of local government aid should not be overlooked. Uh, Greg mentioned it earlier. The state used to give a fair amount of local government aid, and in the early two thousands, which is just when this fee stuff started, partly in response to cutbacks in LGA, and the state has never really return to the level of local government support that it once did. So there's a definite role for the state in solving some of these problems as well. Yeah, I guess as a, as a moderator and a former uh, St. Paul resident whose heart still is in St. Paul, um, I think it would be useful to take a really broad system-wide look at this thing. The Latimer Commission did this for the state local system I think St. Paul is going to be working with the state, by the way, because it is a system. But your payment in lieu of tax point is well taken. Your point about special assessments uh, on nonprofits. But I think the bottom line is we had a real problem here with what we had with a, what was the court said is not reasonable. You can't tax on this square footage. You have to tax on the value of this thing. And that would, by the way, would solve, Greg, your small church versus your, uh, your, your uh, church on the outskirts versus the downtown church. Of course, it, if, uh, if they're not going to be ex uh, uh, taxable under the uh, tax, then we have to look at the payment in lieu of tax approach that, um, uh, that Ellen has suggested. I want to thank you all. Uh, I think it's been a good discussion. We've got a lot of different ways to go. Uh, let me conclude by thanking St. Paul Strong for putting this together. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, thank uh, uh, Steve Brunsberg and his team out there that have been uh, taking care of us tonight and doing the filming. And of course, uh, I'll even I say thank you to the city of St. Paul for allowing us something like SPM, SPNN to uh, get into these kind of discussions. And with that, we'll close. Thank the viewers for staying with us. And perhaps we'll all convene another time at this same topic on the next topic. Thank you.